All right. So while we're waiting, in case uh, you want to just stay busy, you can uh, go ahead and answer some of the polls that we have open as well. So we get to know you a little bit better because the whole point of it every time we do this is we want to tailor the discussion for you. I know a lot of you are excited. Some of you messaged me on LinkedIn about this and uh, we're very excited to have Sarah here. So uh, I think Jake has opened up the poll. So if you can go ahead and answer some of those questions, uh, Jake, definitely let me know what you're learning. So we'll we'll share that back with Sarah as we get into it. So it looks like we've already got about 35 or so people in. So I think I'm going to go ahead and get started and uh, we'll catch other people up as they join us. My name is Sadar. Welcome to Baselane's webinar. Today, we're very excited to have Sarah Weaver on the call. I want to do a quick intro for Sarah. I'll let her introduce herself too. But Sarah is the author of The 30 Day Stay, which I'm excited to talk a little bit more about. She's a speaker, coach, real estate investor, and business owner. She runs three businesses that serve both real estate investors and real estate agents. So she's doing it all. And she's also a very avid traveler. She's been to 50 plus countries, I think probably more now. And uh, she also travels um, around the country coaching real estate agents and hosting intimate retreats for investors. So amazing to have Sarah here. Lastly, I'll mention she's also a Burr investor and a midterm rental investor. So we'll we'll get into all of that as we jump into the conversation. So Sarah, welcome to our webinar at Baseline. Thank you so much for having me. And hi, everyone. It is so good to see you guys. I'm sure everyone knows webinar uh, kind of formats by now, but I have access to the Q&A. So if you guys have questions, anything that I say, if you're like, what is this girl talking about? go ahead and throw it into the Q&A. And so, well, thank you, Sada. It was a really good introduction. So as he said, I'm Sarah Weaver, and I'm here today to talk to you guys about really my kind of two favorite, we'll call them investing strategies, um, out-of-state investing or long-distance investing. And so um, kind of would love to hear from you guys, like where are you calling in from, anything that you can kind of guide me. But for the most part, I'm going to assume that you probably live in an expensive market because most of us do <laughs> and yeah. that you're interested in real estate investing. And so it might not be investing in your backyard. And so that's why I'll make sure I touch a lot on out of state investing. So I think it's really important that you guys understand that I started investing when I lived in an expensive market, not quite Toronto expensive, but I lived in Denver, Colorado, very expensive market. It was really hard to cash flow. And I was looking at the state next door. So I bought a single family home um, in Kansas. And if I knew then what I know now, uh, it would have been really interesting. Um, but I really just kind of dived in. Um, honestly, just kind of like, I hope this works. Um, I think a lot of us know that real estate is a good idea. Like I knew with confidence, even five, six years ago, real estate is how we're going to get wealthy but I was scared. And I think that that's something that I'm not hearing a lot of people talk about, especially authors mm. and hosts and panelists. And so as we sit here today, I want to be very transparent with you guys that I just was really, really nervous with that first investment because I didn't want to buy a bad deal. What if my tenants didn't pay? What if stuff broke? Um, and so I was really, really scared, but I did it anyway. And I think that that's a theme that you guys will hear throughout this. Um, so yeah, I'm I love that. Started. <laughs> I love that. And uh, we've got our poll in and thank you for everybody. 26 uh, of the folks participated. So in terms of how many rental properties do the folks own that are listening so far live with us, we've got a mix. And so uh, about 40% own one. So getting started, 36% own two, about 10% own three, and then 15% own four to 10. Right. What types of rentals are you... Uh, are in your portfolio. Uh, this is this is interesting. So 92% um, midterm and long-term, 56% short-term, and then we've got a 10% fix and flip and 25% owner-occupied multifamily. Do you currently own a midterm rental property or properties? So 42% says yes, but I want to learn more in case I'm missing anything. Well, that's Perfect. great to know. And then 42% said, no, I want to start soon and need some guidance. You came to the right place. And 15% said, no, I've never heard of midterm rentals. We already <laughs> got the question. And that I was going to be my first question, which is, we already did your background. So maybe we'll just jump right into it. What is a midterm rental? How do you Absolutely. define a midterm rental? Absolutely. Great question, you guys. And by the end of this call, not only are you going to know what it is, but you're going to probably be convinced that you should be doing it. And then those of you, the 42% of you that already own MTRs, 
don't worry, this will not be like MTR for beginners. I will go really deep into some things. And so if you're new here to the MTR space, kind of get your pen and paper ready because we're going to move pretty quickly. So I think the most important thing is what the heck is an MTR? What's a midterm rental, a medium term rental? Well, they are a furnished rental, just like an STR, just like a short term rental, an Airbnb. Maybe you've stayed in the Airbnb. It's the same thing except my guests stay for 30 days or more. On average, my guests stay for 87 nights. So mm-hmm. why why are we like even talking about this? Okay, doesn't it just sounds like an Airbnb? No, you guys, it's very, very different because the difference between a two-night stay and a three-night stay and an 87-night stay is that I get to stay sane for about 70 days of that booking. (laughs) And so for me, being a real estate investor, especially long distance, especially fully nomadic, running multiple businesses and multiple properties, I am able to really focus on my other businesses because my midterm rentals don't take up what I call mind space. With my Mm. short-term rental, when I had one, it was great. It made great money. I I love the hospitality piece of it. However, it took up mind space all the time. Like next month, I'm only, you know, 30% booked. Am I going to be 70% mm. vacant? Or oh, I, I know my cleaner is good. I know my cleaner is going to show up today because someone checks out at 10 and a new person checks out at three. But I'm like sitting patiently looking at my phone like, please don't text me. Please don't text me. Please don't text me. Because that means something's wrong. And for me in my lifestyle, that just wasn't for me. So if you're in this call and you're like, yeah, girl, me too, that does not sound like something I want to sign up for, enter the medium term rental because Mm. these midterm rental guests, which I'll talk about who they are, they move in and most of the time they're what I call professional guests. So they already know, they know how to use the lock, they know how to use a toaster, they know how to use a Keurig, they know how to navigate a TV and signing into their Netflix. They're professional guests, and so they're likely not going to bother you. And it might sound counterintuitive, but I do not want to hear from my guests, just like they probably don't want to hear from me. And so I love that there's about 70-ish days of like pure joy and silence while they're paying two to two and a quarter times what a long-term tenant would pay. And so I'll show you guys That's a, in a few of my deals, yeah. but- it's big money. <laughs> That's ahead. a really, uh, just to make sure I understood that and for the audience. So one is if you're self-managing, there's a high amount of stress coming from the STR type because you're yeah. always wondering like, where who's going to book next? Am I going to have a vacancy? Yeah. And especially in the off months, what are you going to do? Right. And the second thing is with the, what you're talking about is with midterm, the customer, really, the target user, the customer, the 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 guest is a different type of guest, yeah. basically, and it it, it does really it is. can make your life easier and less stressful. But also, the lease durations you said are much longer. So I wanted to talk to you about that. So maybe we can get into this. I think we're kind of just jumping into you know like now we talk about what is an MTR, which is thirty day plus. Yeah, uh, we're going to be talking today about how to start an MTR business. But before we get into that, maybe what do you see? And you started, you already started talking about what are the positives, uh, maybe the pros and cons, the trade-offs of having an MTR. Like what are the things you really, really like about it? What are some challenges? Maybe we start there. And uh, yeah, I can absolutely. see already that the longer lease term for me, that would be a huge one, less stress. Yeah, absolutely. So if it's okay with you, I am going to share a, a slide with you guys. Because I think before we dive into the pros and cons, I think the biggest pro is the money. And so let me, before I kind of start throwing P-I-T-I at you and all that kind of stuff, let's talk about this (laughs) fourplex. So so this particular fourplex, I know it looks like a duplex, but it is connected in the back. So this is one building, it's tan. This is one building, it's blue. So these are two different fourplexes. So let's talk about this fourplex. If I were to purchase this fourplex, this is in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Midwest, you know, purchase prices are pretty low, um, even still today. And so here are the numbers. And I'm just going to throw them all up there and I'll pause so that you guys take a look at it and then come back to me and please listen. <laughs> all right. So the purchase price in 2021 
was 328. Yes, this is what things cost in the Midwest. It's amazing. All right. So down payment, 25% down would have been $82,000. My PITI, which is your principal interest taxes and insurance, aka your monthly payment, I'm sure uh, everyone's familiar with that, is $2,003. Now, long-term rent would have been $3,200. And we don't have the chat feature uh, activated right now, but I would love for you guys to ask yourself, would you buy this? You know, $2,000 monthly payment, $3,200 coming in from long-term rent. So, so what do you think? Would you buy this? Yeah, I think uh, I, I personally would want to know the condition of the property. Looks to me like they're newer. Looks like a newer build based on the what I'm just seeing in the photo. Obviously, I'd want to see inside, but I'd want to know the condition of the property. That that directly points to the gap between the 3,200 rent and the PITI, right? Like what is what else is there that I have to spend yeah, money yeah, on? Yeah. Utilities, maintenance, vacancy reserve, all of that stuff. Uh, but it is tight. It seems like once I factor some of those things, it's going to be a little tight. I agree that that is exactly what I thought when I this deal came across my desk. I was like, mm, I don't know. This isn't exactly what I would buy. Nine percent cash on cash in 2021 uh, was still like on the I was doing closer to like 14 percent. And right. so I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Sounds like a lot of work for not a lot of pay. So that is when I looked at furnishing it. So these are actual photos of the unit. It's a one bedroom, one bath, and I furnished the unit. And then I posted these photos on the internet. The internet went wild. No, I'm only kidding. I posted these and I said, I furnished this from afar. So my team furnished this actually while I was living in New Zealand. And this is in Nebraska. That's 8,000 miles away. And I furnished this. And here is what the numbers look like as a midterm rental. So purchase price stays wow. the same, non payment stays the same, your PITI stays the same, but wow is right. Your medium term rent goes from, remember the other slide, 3,200 to 7,500. So now I'm able to get 1875 per unit. Whereas before, if you remember, it was $800. Can I ask a question here, which is, uh, and I'm an investor, so I love to just dig into this stuff and I'll, I kind of want to ask you one of my deals that I'm working on too. So um, <laughs> on this one, how do you think about as you're analyzing this deal, right? Because you have to underwrite well before you're even able to buy it. Uh, how do you analyze the vacancy rate uh, factored into the, the pro forma as you're analyzing the deal? For Great question. 7,500 so versus the 3,000. So the first thing I ask myself is who is my ideal tenant? So like in marketing, you think I you think of your avatar. You do the same thing with, with real estate because again, you're eventually going to market this unit, which is why you, you know, furnish it beautifully. Um, and you're going to market it to who? Well, in the MTR space, I want to be really clear, there's two different types of tenants. There is the displaced insurance policy holder. For those of you mm. that have never heard of it, bear with me. What it means is that a person or family can no longer live in their home because of flood, fire. You're in Toronto. Maybe your pipes freeze and it floods. And then guess what? You can't live in the house because now there's flood, there's mold. It's going to take six months to renovate. So your insurance company is going to pay your rent to go live somewhere else. That is a great great, great tenant for any MTR of really any size, but I particularly think they're great tenants for like your three bedroom, your four bedroom in a nice area. Those tend to be really great MTR guests. All right. This one bedroom, one bath unit, particularly like in this building is situated really close to not only just one hospital, but about seven hospitals here in Omaha, Nebraska. It's a really large hospital complex. And what do hospitals have? They have travel medical professionals. You guys have likely heard of travel nurses, but there's more than just travel nurses. There's the travel anesthesiologist, the radiologist, the physical therapist. There's lots of people coming in to work at hospitals on short-term contracts that need furnished rentals. 
they're typically not your tenant that's going to go stay at the travel lodge or like a motor lodge in town. We definitely have them in Nebraska, but guess what? Then you don't get a kitchen. You don't you need get, a kitchen. Yep. You don't get cozy amenities. You don't get a pottery barn rug, you know, things like that. So, so that is one type of tenant that, that is attracted to these smaller units. The other is really just anyone that's looking for a furnished rental. So let me give you two quick examples. There's a gentleman living in one of my buildings right now whose wife is getting a multiple organ transplant. So he needs a place to stay while she's at the hospital. And when she gets out of the hospital, their house is about four hours away. So she's also going to live in the unit while she does, you know, mm-hmm. out of um, outpatient therapy. Okay. So there's one example. Another example is a gentleman, his name's Joe. He's living in my, one of my units right now because he just got a job in Omaha, Nebraska. It was right before Christmas. His wife was like, there's no way in hell I'm moving to Omaha, Nebraska right before Christmas. So we're going to have Christmas one last time in our house in New Mexico. And then eventually, sure, I guess I'll move to Omaha. And so those are just two examples, but there are so many ways that you can find these types of tenants. And so really quickly, I'll answer the question, how do you find these tenants? Well, I list on Airbnb and FurnishFinder.com. Again, that's FurnishFinder.com. That is where people go when they're looking for these longer term stays. For the displaced insurance policy holders, you should use that very handy chat GPT and ask, what are the temporary housing solutions in my area? Temporary housing solutions. There are tons of companies all across the country who specialize in this and they want to talk to investors like me who treat my furnished rentals like a business. And so it does then become a little more B2B or business to business than B2C, business to customer. Um, But it is absolutely worth it because it's big money. And so Dalton, that answers your questions on how to find tenants. And then um, let's see, how do you find so tenants? Go ahead. Yeah, so maybe maybe let's I want to recap it for everybody so they can take Great. some notes and make sure they got it. So we talked about a couple of different uh avatars or personas. Really like when you open this business up, who is your customer? So you talked about the insurance uh the folks that need a place to stay if they are um getting help from their insurance to be moved while their property is being fixed up or you know something happened and they need a, a residence, right? The yep. traveling nurses or the medical staff, but also traveling patients and their families. Yep. And uh, really also you said anybody that doesn't want to go into one of those like hotels, but needs a furnished place for a little, little while. So several different types of customers. And you talked about using Furnish Finder as well as Airbnb. Correct. And uh, I had a question for you there when you talk about where to get them. And the last thing you said is uh, use a, 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 a solution like ChatGPT, which is a new AI solution for those that don't know. Uh, you can go to ChatGPT and then type in what are the temporary housing solution providers in your city, in your state. And uh, I just did it for my area, which is Philadelphia, where I invest. And uh, I got eight options right here. So disaster housing services, national corporate housing, there's a whole list. I'm actually going to call them tomorrow to see what that is. So that's where to find them as well, right? I had one question for you. Do you use Facebook groups as well? Because I see people also trying to get uh, tenants and folks coming in through Facebook. Yeah, great question. And someone asked a great question in the chat. Sylvia asked, how do you connect and market to hospital staff if your property is close to several hospitals? Simple answer, I don't. And so Mm. I simply list on Airbnb and Furnish Finder and I'm 97% occupied. So could you list in Facebook groups? Absolutely. Did I do it at the beginning? Yes. But I found it wasn't even worth my time. It didn't, it was completely unnecessary. And so I know that at the beginning when you don't have an MTR, it can be really nerve wracking. You're like, but what if I can't find guests? I am telling you with confidence that I am 97% occupied just by listing on Airbnb and Furnish Finder. And so can you connect with, you know, relocation specialists and, you know, the hospital themselves or list in Facebook groups? Absolutely. Those are really great solutions if you're having a hard time getting bookings, but I don't even have to do that. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, one question for you. Now. We talked about the, you know, what you're doing in this example. We talked about the type of customers and where to find them. One question, maybe taking a step back, is like when you're trying to buy these deals, are you looking for a certain bedroom bathroom count in terms of what I'm you think not, is ideal? Yeah, I'm not because now I have all of these different tools in my toolbox. Whereas if I got a kick-ass four bedroom, I know how to furnish that as an MTR. If I got a one bedroom, one bath, two bedroom, one bath, three bedroom, two bath, I can figure it out. Here's what I want to tell you guys. And I think this is really, really important. No matter what investing strategy you're going to do, don't get so married to the idea of buying a duplex in Philadelphia that you're, you're passing over great single family homes in Philadelphia that would be great deals as well. And so I love uh, comparing real estate investing to dating. And so like how many of my friends are single because in their mind, they have this Mr. Perfect and they're saying no to all these really, frankly, good guys that could work and be good deals. I mean, good partners. And so it's the same thing. So don't just look for a certain unit count or unit size. I think it's really important that you hone your skills as a real estate investor and you learn how to analyze deals. That should be like your number one skill. And then the second is just go find really good deals or figure out your deal flow, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, and, and you can make any deal work. That's awesome. So kind of in this, I know there's a lot of questions and I'll, we'll get to them as we go through the topics. I promise we'll do our best. And so, um, Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to continue with the presentation here as we're getting yeah, into absolutely. this. Yep. And let, let me, let us know, keep the questions coming. I am pretty good at multitasking, so I'll do my best to like tie in answers. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, my team, uh, does this for a living. So now we analyze deals, we'll furnish them and we'll help you launch them. So not only do I do this for myself, but I now do this for other investors. And so I've seen what we're talking about work for hundreds of real estate investors, in addition to the, you know, 17,000 people that have bought my book, which I really appreciate you guys. Um, and so I wanted to get back to this slide just to make sure we answer our questions. There were some questions about like, is this pricing normal? So 1875 is a little bit high for my area. I find that you can go a little bit higher if you furnish them really well. And as you guys can see from those photos that we lingered on in the last slide, these aren't fancy. Like there, there's nothing luxury about them, but they are beautifully decorated they, I have a professional photographer, and then I'm really good at getting back to my tenants right away. So I treat this truly like a business, and I think that that's really, really important that you do as well. Um, this also, just so that we're very clear about numbers, you are paying utilities when you are offering a furnished rental. And so after the 7,500, that's when I'm paying utilities. Um, but as you guys can see, I mean, I'm never spending $5,000 a month on utilities. And so it still is a really, really great deal. And then as far as cost to furnish at the time of furnishing, and because I own the company, um, I was spending about, gosh, probably five to $6,000 a unit. That is absolutely unrealistic and impossible to do today. Uh, inflation is real and it hit furniture 26%. 26%. So whatever you bought your couch for three, four years ago, Robert, like that's not going to work. Right. And so realistically for a beautiful one bedroom, one bath, you're looking at probably about 8,900. And for a really kind of mid level three bedroom, two bath, we're doing them for about 18,000. And so, so these aren't $40,000, which I think some people assume too high. But then often, often, more often than not, investors are assuming too low. And so make sure you guys yeah. are doing that. Do you recommend when uh, furnishing, do you recommend getting brand new furniture, for example? Or how, what's your strategy typically with that? Yeah, I've, I've done it all, you guys. I have, you know, gotten a U-Haul cargo van, drove around town, Facebook marketplace, trying to get a $10 cure egg. Um, but for anyone that's ever tried to buy or sell anything on Facebook Marketplace, it's full of a bunch of flaky people. Not, I don't think it's creepy. I don't think it's dangerous. I've like backpacked the world. I'm not worried about that, but I am worried about wasting my time. And so what I can tell you now with confidence is that the units where I bought 
everything new. I mean, we're talking the sheets, the, well, obviously the sheets, but the spoons, the coffee table, the nightstands, everything brand new out of a box. Some schmuck, usually me, has to put all the stuff together, which is, you know, obviously the hardest part. Um, yes. That usually is the faster, more efficient, and sometimes cheaper way to do it. So for example, this beautiful couch that I'm sitting on right now, I'm not sitting at my desk because I decided I am waiting for a very fancy desk chair to arrive. And so this couch I'm sitting on right now, it was $290. And so that doesn't break the bank. Whereas if you go find one off Craigslist, you're having to move it, you're having to do all these things. And so often it's a lot easier and more efficient to just buy every single thing new. And for your guys' audience, I have my furnishing list. We do sell it, but it has the furnishing list. It, it doesn't just tell you that, yeah, you're going to need a couch and nightstands and the lamp. We actually link to the couch and the nightstands and the art that we recommend. And we have scoured the internet. We've looked at things like host uh, GPO, Minoan, and we tend to mm. be able to beat prices by piecing things together like Walmart, Wayfair, Amazon. And before you guys knock Walmart, their Better Homes and Garden line is absolutely stunning. Um, I bought a TV stand from them that really looks almost identical to West Elm, um, especially in photos. And that's what really matters. And so that's the biggest thing when you're furnishing is make sure that you're thinking, how will this photograph? And as an investor, then you need to ask, how will this live? How durable is this? How realistic is it that, you know, this couch yeah. or this chair or even this throw blanket with like the frillies and the dongles on it, that's not going to last. And so always be thinking, and, and I am that detailed, like when I buy a throw pillow, a decorative pillow, I already am thinking, how am I going to wash and care for this so that this isn't just throwing $22 out the window? That's a great tip. Um, there are some questions about the markets to, to invest. So- Maybe thinking about this analysis that you're showing here, uh, how did you land on this market? Like, are you market agnostic and you kind of figure out based on the local dynamics if it's a good deal or not? Or do you focus on certain mar markets? Yeah, great question. So I look at five metrics. I'm looking at, and I look at the same five metrics even when I'm investing long term. Okay. So why? Because what if someday you don't want to own a furnished rental anymore? Well, I want to buy properties. I want to invest in properties in markets that I think are a good deal for both long term and medium term. So I'm looking at five metrics. I'm looking at population growth. Are people actually moving there? Yes, guys, people really do move to Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I'm actually here right now uh, working on a project and it's snowing. So I'm not super pleased, but other people like to move here, like my tenant, Joe. Then why are they moving here? Like Joe, job growth. So what what industries are are in are popular in that area? By the way, guys, use chat GPT for all of this. Um, I will give you some resources and websites, um, but they will it will make your life so, so easy. So you're asking, like, what are the big industries in Omaha or Philadelphia? Um, so population growth, job growth, uh, wage and uh, income growth. I want to know that my tenants are making more money so that I can raise rent over mm -hmm. time. Rent rate increases. This is going to focus on long-term rent rates. I want to see that my neighboring investors, my fellow landlords in the area are raising rent so that I can too. And then crime rate. I want crime to go is the only metric that I want to be going down. And those are the types of things that I'm looking for. So I can already like hear the grumble in the webinar. People are like, okay, that doesn't help me narrow it down at all, Sarah. Exactly. Honestly, like the ability to invest in the United States is like one of the greatest blessings because you can really make money anywhere. There are real estate investors who are doing a great job outside of LA. There are real estate investors that are crushing it in rural Iowa. And so it really is possible to make this work anywhere, even with the MTR strategy. So let's take rural Iowa as example. You may be the only furnished rental in town. Well, guess what? There is a need for it because there's always work. And they, that person may otherwise be commuting, you know, 45, 50 minutes. And they're going to be so stoked to actually see a furnished rental in that small town. Yeah, super helpful. So uh, now we talked a little bit about the market. So yeah, sorry, sorry, we're giving you the the tools to how to analyze any market, really. 
Yep. Uh, from there, we, we already talked about the types of units. And I think your answer there was it could be one to two bed. It could be three to four. It just really depends on the target you're going for. And you have techniques you teach people that can really make any of those work, which is also really great. Um, I think there's more questions in the chat, but um, I wanted to see if you wanted to continue here to uh, talk through this more before we get yeah, into some absolutely. of the questions. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But Veet asked a fantastic question that I, I think this will be the most useful, I hope, for people who are in the audience that already own an MTR, because I know that there's a lot of you. So they're asking, how do you make your listing stand out to potential MTR tenants on Airbnb? MTR listings stick out like a sore thong, uh, thumb among the sea of STRs due to the higher than average rate. And I'm afraid that the high rates would turn away most potential tenants. So what I find is that the Airbnb listing needs to be just as beautiful as if it was an STR. And so, and then Airbnb gives you the ability to offer these monthly discounts and specify there's actually a checkbox saying like I can accommodate longer stays. And then of course their algorithm will then put you in front of people that are looking for that. And so I make sure that I'm just as stunning as my neighboring STR, even if I'm not, you know, I'm not putting a neon sign or like an Instagram wall in my STR because I'm not, you know, catering to a true STR. Um, but as you can see, even from the art behind me, like it's a very tastefully decorated place. And I make sure that my photography shows that. And then some more details is in your listing, every single photo needs to have a caption. So you're not just saying TV. You're not just saying smart TV. No, I want to know that this is a TCL 55 inch, like equipped with, with all the things. And then I'm also telling a story. So as hokey or cheesy as you want it to sound, like soak into our incredibly plush couch and like, you know, waste the day's stress away on our 55 inch smart TV with all of your favorite TV shows with our high speed internet. And I'm specifying all these types of features that an MTR guest would really care about. So here are some of the things MTR guests care about. They care about great bedding, a great mattress, blackout curtains. I think a sound machine is a really nice touch and they're $11. Um, and being able to park and get into the unit safely. So you have to keep in mind, especially when you're working with these travel medical professionals, they're getting off of a 12 hour shift. They're exhausted. They don't want to park five blocks away. And if they are, you're in a, a city, then they also want to feel safe. And so making sure that you have motion sensor lights, it's well lit. Um, even if you guys don't have kids, I always think like, think like your, you know, 18 year old daughter is going to live in this house. How would you want her to get into the house? Um, and that those are some of my very quick tips. That's great. So we talked about how to make the unit really highlighted and I'm assuming you're taking professional photos. I mean, that goes unsaid in terms of the listing itself. You talked a lot about the description. I'm curious, do you also use ChatGPT to write the description? I do. The, uh... and, and we do something really cool. Uh, we look at our greatest competition in like it. So for example, I'm looking in Omaha, like who would book that unit over me? And then my mm. virtual assistant in the Philippine is going in and going to their reviews on their Airbnb, copy and pasting the entire review, all the reviews, copy and paste so quick pasting it into chat GPT and asking mm. chat GPT, what are some of the key featured mentioned the most in these reviews? Mm. Okay. That's awesome. So you can do the analysis of it too. Yes. And that's when I realized, oh shit, I need a sound machine. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. So th there's more questions here, but another question is related to the lease. There's a couple of questions I think in here about the lease document or, you know, the leasing process yeah, absolutely. of the MTR. So, How so do you manage book, that? When they book through Airbnb, it's all handled through Airbnb. Some MTR hosts have decided to put another layer of safety and agreement in addition to Airbnb. So maybe you guys have experienced this. I have where I, as the guest, stayed at an Airbnb in Sedona and they had me sign an additional agreement. So some MTR hosts are doing that. Full transparency, I do not. I am also not an attorney. I only play one on TV. So do not take this as legal advice. This is just my experience. 
So when it comes to Airbnb, they're finding me on Airbnb, they're booking through Airbnb, where I'm not dealing with anything off of Airbnb. If they find me another way, like through the Facebook groups or through a referral or through Furnish Finder, and I do a move in fee for all of you MTR hosts, stop calling it a cleaning fee and call it a move in fee. Even though it is a cleaning fee, you and I know that. But the moment you call it a cleaning fee, guess what? Your guess is like, well, I ain't cleaning because I paid a cleaning fee. But if you call it a move in fee, they're more likely to clean. I do a $150 move in fee. I do allow pets. I do a $200 non refundable pet fee and a $175 okay. pet deposit that is refundable per pet. That's great because if the pet eats my beautiful pillow, which I probably shouldn't have gone cream, going a little crazy on this unit, um, then guess what? That's coming out of their security deposit. Or if they book through Airbnb, it's coming through air cover. So yeah, so just for our audience, so Sarah, obviously uh baseline, you can collect rent through baseline too with all those fees. And we just recently launched a lease creation uh, where you can also create a lease. Now, those are usually traditional long-term leases, but you can modify it to a midterm lease if you want. Amazing. But I, I think the terms are similar, right? Like any lease agreement, whether it's long-term or midterm, really the duration is the main difference between a traditional long-term lease or a midterm lease. And, and specifying so the, about utilities and who owns what. So making right, the, sure that it's yeah. really clear that you own the appliance so that when even your MTR guest checks out, they don't check out with your fridge. Right. And all the furniture, right? So I think the unique part uh, is, uh, and I think you have uh, mentioned this in your book too, is like, like you do have to obviously have an inventory of everything you own and that you provided. So in an MTR, if you have furniture, are you making a list of that? Like, you know, through like if they're coming in and you have all, you provided all these items uh, that obviously that's being furnished for them. So that's part of the lease. Yeah, what I have is I have an inventory list and then I also just always have photos. My cleaner takes photos before and after each check-in. Okay. So for example, they move it, they my cleaner arrives to let's say a dirty unit, right? The the tenant just checked out. My tenant, my sorry, my cleaner is taking photos of everything, opening the cabinet doors and taking photos so that there is no argument about, well, that wasn't there when I got there. Like, no, listen, we have a photo. Then she's cleaning and then she's taking another photo showing me, look, this is how it was set before I left so that we know what the unit looks like when the tenant left. That's awesome. That's a great tip. So that allows you to make sure that everything is there. It's in good shape, et cetera. Have you ever had a, there was a question in here earlier. I couldn't find it exactly, but I remember reading it. Have you ever had a guest overstay their Never. Their lease where you have to evict them or get involved legally or anything like that? No, never. And I've never heard of it happening with MTR guests. Again, these are professional guests. They likely are here for a contract. Um, they are in good standing, especially with people like Airbnb. And so that's never happened. Um, there's two comments I want to touch on. It says, what is your furnished finder versus Airbnb split look like? It's so interesting. I track this really closely right now. I'm 80% Airbnb, 20% furnished finder. Whereas a year ago, it was almost exactly the, the opposite. And so that's why it, I think it's so important to be listed on both. Um, another comment was made. Andrew says a major player in the temporary housing game, ALE solutions announced that they're changing their focus to unfurnished housing. Andrew, I'm so glad that you mentioned this. This is just like headline clickbait. ALE Solutions have has always, always focused on unfurnished housing as well as furnished housing. They make more money if they go to Saad and say, hey, I see you have an unfurnished property in Philadelphia. I have this insurance claim policy holder who wants to move in. And then they're also going to broker a deal with rented furniture. And they still are looking for hosts like me that have furnished housing. And so it really was just like the internet going crazy. Andrew, trust me, all of us MTR hosts got together. We've talked to ALE Solution and we're like, somebody just like went absolutely wild with this headline because it's been like that the whole time. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for answering that. Absolutely. And uh, there's a couple of more questions in here. So I think we'll continue moving the discussion forward. So there's some questions here about tax implications as well. So do you see a difference? Obviously, we talked about deal analysis and performance. Do you see a difference between short-term and midterm rentals when it comes to tax implications? 
I'm not yeah, sure what uh, they're implying there with tax, maybe yeah, tax deductions. Yeah, I know, or, yeah, I, I yeah. know the question. So what, what I first, of course, I'm not a CPA. This is not financial advice. Um, however, what's important to understand is that in the eyes of ta for tax purposes only, it was what we're talking about, your like STR regulations, that's something totally different, you guys. But as far as for taxes, if your average nightly stay for the whole year is less than seven nights, you're an STR. If your average nightly stay is higher than seven nights, you're a long-term rental or an MTR. And so I won't go into the details of the tax implications because, frankly, I don't have them all memorized and I do not want to mess that up. But that is something yeah. that you need to, no matter how many rental properties you have, you really need a tax professional who understands all of this. So just to be very clear, I have a bookkeeper. She's $15 an hour. She lives overseas. No, she cannot take you on as a client. Everybody asks. She's completely busy because I've already given her to too many people. So $15 an hour. I have a bookkeeper. She handles everything. Okay. Then I have a CPA. They are the ones filing my taxes. Yes, they understand investing. Yes, they understand real estate. And they really understand people like me who are self-employed. Now I also have a tax strategist. And so mm. I have someone who is really looking at what should Sarah Weaver do this year, right now, January, 2024, to set herself up for success, not just for 2024 taxes, but for beyond. And so that was really the missing piece that I was not getting that type of service from my tax preparer, aka my CPA. And so that really was a huge, huge difference. So that is my urge to you guys is invest in yourself, invest in your business and get these people on your team. That's helpful. And uh, for the audience, we actually have a tax CPA strategist coming on a webinar next next Thursday. So Amazing. look out for that. If you haven't already, sign up for that one and uh, definitely we'll bring, we'll bring these questions in there because I think that's great to talk about the different strategies and how the tax implications and strategies differ based on the type of investments. And so I think we've got, let's say, about five more minutes left here. Lots of questions in here. So Sarah, maybe you can help me out too. We're going to try to see if we can tackle some of these questions here. Uh, yeah, one question we do... Yeah. Adrian yeah. Ford's asking a really timely question. So they said, they said, can you start the, can you share the key team members that you have on your team? So uh -huh. I just talked about tax and strategy. So now let's talk about my actual, uh, like, you know, boots on the ground. I have two people that I through really three people that I couldn't live without my cleaner. Like I said, she's willing to do the, like go the extra mile and take the photos because she understands hey, this did not look like this when I cleaned last. So Sarah's going to be have to pay for this. And so let's see if Sarah can, you know, get some of this from the tenant or from Airbnb. So she's on my team. I hope that's really clear. Like she is not, I don't look at her as my employee. She's my bud. She gets a bottle of tequila for Christmas. Like we're buds. All right. Uh, we probably are going to go on a trip because we like cannot stop talking about traveling. But I told her, you're my cleaner. You can't go on vacation. No, but so that person is so, so, so important. And so make sure that you really are like uh, creating a relationship with them. Next is your handyman. This is not an HVAC guy, a plumber, a fine carpenter. Those types of contractors are expensive. You need an hourly handyman and they should be actually handy. Um, I cannot tell you how many handymen I've gone through where I'm like, I asked you to like hang this curtain and it's lopsided. Like that's not, you're not handy. I could have done that. Um, and so they have to actually be handy and they need to understand your business. So they can't be like, oh yeah, I'll get to it when I can. No, they need to understand that if a toilet doesn't work in a one bedroom, one bath, they need to get to it right away. So my handyman is amazing. We're also on like a texting basis. And then next is what I call a runner. So a runner is for me, it's a, it's a high school kid. I have a high school kid that I trust so, so much because he is amazing. And I know his mom, his mom's a real estate investor. So he grew up doing this kind of stuff and he is cheaper than my handyman. And he's who I call when, you know, the tenant can't figure out the TV and I, I have to send someone over and I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Um, or the trash is full and they're like, oh, it's not my trash. Oh, it's your trash. So I'm like, whatever, I'll just send the high school kid over there and I'll take the trash. So Cleaner, handyman, runner. And then I build what's called a vendor list. It sounds fancy, but it's just a simple spreadsheet. 
And it is not just one plumber, it's five plumber. It's not right now, it's snowing like crazy. I don't have one snow removal guy. I have four snow removal guys. And so that vendor list is something that you grow over time. Uh, you mentioned Facebook groups. I'm getting all of this contact information from Facebook. Okay. I am joining Omaha real estate investors or Philadelphia real estate, the Philadelphia RIA. And then I'm actually not posting in any of these groups. So make sure you guys are listening. Do not post in these groups. Some other schmuck has already written, who's a good plumber? So you can just go and click that search bar type in the word plumber inside the Facebook group. And there's already probably seven posts. I have, again, uh, my team, I now have a virtual assistant. She's going in and she's copying and pasting those comments into the vendor list, ideally before we need them. So um, I think that's really, really important because you don't want to be, oh, who's your plumber? Who's your plumber when you need a plumber right that minute? Um, so I think that that's everyone tied to the building. And then I've mentioned my assistant a couple of times. I have two virtual assistants in the Philippines. One does handle most everything related to property management because of the cold. I'll give a quick story because of the cold this weekend, we got down to negative 22 Fahrenheit, which I'm pretty sure is like basically negative 22 Celsius. And, um, the batteries on one of my Schlage locks stopped working they were messaging in the, the guest was messaging in the Airbnb app. It buzzed on my phone. And before I could even read the message, my assistant in the Philippines was answering. Um, and so having that like barrier between me and the guest has been a godsend. Is there anyone else yeah. that I'm, that, that you think we should talk about who, sh who should be on your team? Yeah. I think you mentioned a lot. I think in your book, you had mentioned that your cleaner actually sometimes does supply runs for you too, which yes. I thought was interesting. And so yes. that means she's really involved. She knows what you need and she's uh, she or he is able to get in there and get stuff for you if you need as well. Yeah, what's really cool now that I have the virtual assistant, my virtual assistant is texting my cleaner and ordering something at Target for pickup. My cleaner can just go to Target, doesn't even have to get out of her car and the cleaning supplies get put in my cleaner's car. Um, that's only in a bind, you guys. That's not like the system that that's we have set typically. up. That's not Okay. Exactly. That's like when, hey, I got here and I don't know where the entire shampoo bottle is gone or whatever it might be. Um, so, but that it's, it's just been amazing. Yeah. So somebody, uh, I think uh, Xavier, you had asked about where do you find them? So we talked about that, like check out the Facebook groups, just search in the history, as Sarah's saying, and you'll be able to find some other people that already asked that question. Most likely I'm assuming outside of Facebook, there's probably other forums like bigger pockets and things like that too where you could do it. And there's also now a lot of like other communities, like WhatsApp communities. I think if you connect into your local network, uh, whatever city you're in, connect with some real estate agents, some brokers, right? Some lenders, you'll start to develop relationships and they, they're also investors. So they'll have these kind of contacts for you too. So that should be able to help you find, you know, and build your team. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people really underestimate the power of networking. Um, I, at the very beginning, when I bought, I actually own this blue building in this photo as well. And when I bought that building, I was living in a van in New Zealand. And I knew no one in Omaha, Nebraska. And I joined all these Facebook groups. And I was a, more or less a professional stalker. And I learned really quickly, like, okay, this guy, Chad, he's a complainer. He's always saying something negative. I'm never going to message him. But this guy, Ted, he's really helpful. And he's always commenting valuable information. He's always like the first one to comment on the thread. I'm probably going to message Ted when I need something. And you can learn all of that just by scrolling on the Facebook group. That's super helpful. So we are going to try to wrap it up. But Sarah, I wanted to just... Um ask a couple of quick questions for the audience so that they, they can help, you know, uh, obviously there's a lot of tips here. One of the more important things is like, what do you recommend for the folks? And I think a lot of the questions were from folks that had tried this already, it seems like. So what do you recommend for the newer folks that are starting out? There is a fear factor. Look, I got into midterm rentals like a year ago, accidentally because of the Airbnb law changes, had to get into midterm. I was definitely afraid, nervous. I don't know if it's going to work and so on. What do you recommend for those folks and how should they be learning about this more going forward? Yeah, I, I think first you have to realize that fear is inevitable. Like even these people that own, you know, 10 plus properties, we all have been scared at some point. 
But the difference between them and you, the person who hasn't taken action yet, is that they functioned in the fear. And so I think that's something that I do really well is I know Mm. that I can figure probably anything out. It will be less painful if I can, you know, get more answers before I just jump. Um, But I know that I can figure anything out. And so the first thing you have to do is you have to believe in your ability to problem solve. And, and I think one of the best ways to gain confidence is through education. And so even just showing up on this webinar on a Thursday, like you guys are doing the work. And so now the piece that you're probably missing is action because there's really a simple formula for results. It's education times action equals results. And you know, math, elementary math, anything times zero is zero. So no matter how much education you have, if you take zero action, you, it's it's going to be September of this year and you're going to own no more properties. And so if you're really serious about buying real estate, you need to take be serious about the action step. And so really quickly, I'll kind of walk you through the action steps. So it is become an amazing analyzer. You need to be really, really good at analyzing deals. Um, I have a bunch of free resources on my website um, I can put in front of you guys if you'd like, Um, but you also have so much access to education. I mean, podcasts, books, there's so much free stuff out there, which I think is amazing. So really master analyzing deals. I don't think that should be something that you outsource, even if you suck at math. Guys, I have a degree in journalism and international studies. I wanted to be an international journalist. I don't like math, but I like money. So I learned how to be good at math. Um, next is you need to pick a market. If you go to sarahdweaver.com forward slash markets, I have a resource with those five metrics that I mentioned, the websites that I use to find them, everything's in there. You need to pick a market and then you need to build a team. I like to work with investor friendly agents because I like to be gallivanting around the world. I'm headed to Orlando this weekend, Cabo the next, Argentina the next, and Antarctica the weekend after that. And so I really am traveling full time. And so I want an investor friendly agent who's door knocking, calling for sale by owners, sending out mailers. I want my agent to be doing that so that I'm not doing that. And then you need to write offers. Uh, you, You really, really have to write a lot of offers. And some deals just won't pencil out. That doesn't mean that you're an idiot. It doesn't mean that this isn't gonna work. It just means that you haven't found the deal yet. I love that. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, where can people find you and are you going to appear in any events this year? Yeah. Great question. Um, Yes. You guys can find me at sarahdweaver.com. And then as I mentioned, I do have some free resources for you guys. And so here is that resource where I can help you analyze markets. So it's just sarahdweaver.com slash markets. And then if you go to my website, sarahdweaver, you will see all of the other things, including my upcoming trips. So one of the things that I do that's really, really fun is I take real estate investors on epic adventures. And so I mentioned Antarctica. I am taking 11 real estate investors to Antarctica. No, wow. not to look at real estate, <laughs> but just to Any hang rentals out. down there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but just to hang out with each other so that we can have conversations like this. Like I like someone put in the chat, like, hey, I'm listed on Furnish Finder, but I'm like, I don't have as much. Or Adrian says, we have a four bedroom, three bath duplex. We're renting out one side. Like, I want to have these conversations over a glass of wine and have an epic bucket list trip that is all a business expense. And so if that sounds like something you guys would like to be a part of, come to my next trip. If you're like, I live in Toronto, I do not want to go somewhere cold. Uh, we do go to warm places as well. Um, If you're a hiker, we do lots of hiking. And so my website's really the best way to find all of that. And then, of course, Instagram. And my Instagram handle is the same as my website, Sarah D. Weaver. Um, If you guys liked anything that you heard, you have any questions um, that I wasn't able to get to, um, just message me. Um, I'm more than happy to help because I had a lot of real estate investors you know, two, 10 steps ahead of me helping me. So I'm more than happy to help you guys. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for having us. We'll definitely send out your contact information, your Instagram, your website after as well to everybody that registered. And for everybody that's here, I know folks want to kind of like see what else we missed. So we'll send out the recording. We'll put it on our YouTube channel. And uh, Sarah has been very generous with her time and offering to help you. So thank you so much, Sarah. Lots of engagement. I think we might have to have you come back. (laughs) There's uh, (laughs) a- Yeah, and and turn turn on the- 
turn on the chat. I'm like, oh, I could keep going. Yeah, guys. we'll just keep um, going. So I, I did forget, and my publisher would really appreciate it if I do share. So if you haven't bought my book, um, I can offer you 10% off. So if you go to ilovemtr.com, um, you can get 10% off my book if you haven't ordered it already. Um, I would really appreciate it and join the, you know, 17,000 other people that have bought it. And I appreciate, I saw some comments in the Q and a that people had read it and I really appreciate that you guys. Yeah. The book is amazing. Congratulations. Uh, I'm almost done with it. I, I'm loving every minute. I, I sent it to my partner. I was like, Hey, you have to read this book right now. And thank so, you. Uh, yeah, it's really great. Congratulations. And again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you guys so, so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Sarah. Take care. Bye.